photographie à l'Université d'Illinois à Chicago et titulaire de la chaire Wayne Mayer en ergothérapie. Elle est une chercheure d'avant-garde renommée dans le domaine de la recherche, recherche action communautaire, plus particulièrement en ce qui a trait aux opportunités et aux disparités de participation pour les personnes ayant des incapacités. Elle a présidé et participé à plusieurs comités nationaux et internationaux relatifs aux droits et aux expériences vécues par les personnes handicapées vivant dans la communauté, comme la Society for Disability Studies et le Participation and Rehabilitation Evidence-Based Practice Panel of the American Occupational Therapy Association. Her studies focus on developing evidence-based interventions for improving home, community, work and social participation opportunities for people with disabilities, always with clear purpose of advancing policy and systems change. Dr. Hamill, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And a very big thank you to you for inviting me to Montreal and the University of Montreal um, to speak about something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart, um, both as a, a researcher and as an occupational therapist, but even more importantly as a member of the disability community myself and a member of the disability rights community. Um, I want to talk specifically about this concept of participation, but I want to treat it very differently than a rehabilitation approach to it, and I want to take it on as a social disparity, and what might we learn in rehab if we look at it in that way. So first of all, I want to get you to reflect a little bit, a little chancy late in the afternoon, hopefully you've had your coffee. Um, I want you to think for a minute about what does it mean to you to fully participate in society? What comes to your mind? What do you see in your mind's eye of what full participation means to you? What things are most important to you? So important that if they were taken away, it would be uh, an enormous um, negative impact on your own identity. I'm guessing, as you were thinking about that question, um, you were thinking about lots of things related to everyday life, having a social relationship, having a meaningful job that actually has some gratification with it, not just for the paycheck, um, being able to have a family, to be a parent, um, to have a child. All these kinds of things come to mind. And when we look at occupational therapy, theory and conceptual models, and even in rehabilitation, that's also what we are saying in rehabilitation, is front and center the purpose. We're saying that what we do should be contributing to people's participation and their well-being. And not just in the United States model, but also in the Canadian model um, of occupational performance as well. But let's look at some of the research for a minute that tells us what we're really doing in therapy outside that black box. Um, and this is a study from the United States. There's lots of other follow-up studies to this one showing the same trends. Um, I'm not sure if you looked at this in Canada. It would be an interesting one to compare. But what we found in the United States is that the majority of occupational therapy time is spent in impairment remediation as the focus. The body structure and function, the, the talking, the walking, the moving um, piece of it, or in training people on basic ADLs. Okay. Very little time percentage-wise is spent on areas like community integration, community participation, and things related to that. But with the people that did get that, the outcomes are better. So in reality, in a lot of our therapy, instead of that beautiful concentric circle that you see in our OT drawings, instead we see a gap right between what we say we do in rehab and whether people with disabilities really are realizing those outcomes, right, because of rehab or through rehab. So some of the key questions from the disability community in this case are, what if someone can't physically or cognitively do by him or herself, e.g. that functional independence score? What happens to them after rehab? What if someone doesn't have money to do, <coughs> despite high motivation, high volition, and desire to do? What then? And what if family or caregivers or even systems don't allow someone to do? What then? So their question back to us is, does this mean that these individuals can't participate? Or should we wait to work on participation until they're, quote, ready? Something I often hear from therapists is they weren't ready yet in the time we had with them. 
Um, and they also then sa say, how has rehab prepared them for living life well and fully participating with a long-term disability post-rehabilitation? So the famous ICF model, we've been on the left side of this diagram in the majority of what we're doing in medical care. Increasingly, the focus and the timing is right to move it towards the participation in context and of this world. This also fits with what's happening in healthcare system service delivery. So what you're seeing here is a picture of the expanded chronic care model um, out of Canada. Um, that's used, uh, has been used for a model for healthcare systems change throughout Europe and even within our Affordable Care Act in the United States. And basically what this model is telling us is that there's a large, significant number of people who are living lives for many, many years with many chronic conditions and many long-term disabilities. And we need to be much more responsive to what healthcare would look like for these folks if it was delivered in the community and focused on participation on creating supportive environments and managing that participation long term. We also see this on the international stage, right? The World Health Organization has adopted the social determinants of health model as a way to look at health disparities. But what I think is interesting about this is look at what they say their main outcome is. They've identified its social participation and empowerment. So even at the world health level now, they're focusing on this term, it's more than simply health and health outcomes that we typically think about in medicine. It's up to the level of social participation and empowerment that we need to be looking at. And the other thing that I think social determinants of health model is useful for is giving you some frameworks about looking at how does the environment affect participation, okay? So not trying to change the individual here, but trying instead to change the world around them um, to enable more participation. And so the social determinant starts at this micro level of the immediate environment in your home, home mods, assistive tech, these kinds of things that we know a lot about in rehab, right? We do a lot of this. But it tells us that we should be looking much more closely at what's happening in the community out there, livable communities, livable neighborhoods, access to support and resources in that community and also at the macro level, the social, policy, political, and economic issues that are on an everyday basis influencing choice and control of everything people with disabilities are trying to participate in. So I want you to think about those models, and I also want you to think about those critiques you heard from the disability community right at the front of this. And what I want to focus in this presentation is I want to give you lots of examples of what people with disabilities are telling us about participation what it means, what's important, and what are some of the issues they feel rehab might be missing along the way. I want to share a lot of findings from participatory action research projects that we've been doing over the last two decades, actually. Um, recently focusing on trying to create and evaluate some participation and environmental assessment tools and um, focused intervention projects as well and then end with some future directions and calls from the disability community on how to get us to think more as rehab professionals in the terminology of disparities and what could we be offering to, um, to moving people with disabilities forward in decreasing those disparities and instead increasing opportunities in society. And what you're seeing here is a lot of different participatory research on participation. Try to say that 10 times fast. <laughs> I always laugh, everybody always laughs at me when I say, that's what I do, I do participatory research on participation. Um, this, this kind of gives you a chronology um, of over the last about 20 years, a lot of the research that we've been focusing on with disability communities. It started by looking at just barriers and supports to participation in context. And particularly, these two projects were with people with cognitive disabilities, which we were bringing up earlier um, to look at what that access was like for them. Um, the second set of research I'm going to refer to is we took the findings from that and we started to develop item banks and new assessment tools that reflect the insider perspective of people with disabilities, right? So I want to talk about some of those um, as well. And then finally, I want to bring into play some newer research we're doing that's looking much more at what's happening at a community and societal level. What are the environmental factors in that community that might also be indicative of participation disparities, and how could we inform communities to be able to be more responsive and change as well? So when I look across all these different kinds of qualitative and action research studies, 
repeatedly I hear four different themes come to the, to the forefront from the disability communities that we've worked with. Um, all of them are things that they say are incredibly important to participation. And all of them, they would say, we have some learning to do in rehabilitation about where we could go with each of these topics. So I, I want to briefly just hit on all four of these and also share with you some assessment strategies you might be able to use to get at some of these in rehab. So the first issue um, from the community is, how can you participate if you can't get in the door, right? Um, we've already heard this one um, today several times. This is an issue of entry into participation. And getting in the door can mean different things to different people with disabilities. Um, what you're seeing here is one of our original studies. Um, we, we worked with people after a stroke and people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we went out and we asked them, are you participating in the community? The majority of people were not. They were not getting out of their homes and feeling like they were meaningfully participating. Um, but we said, okay, what do you want to participate in? <laughs> if you could, what would you? Um, and they chose some goals, right? And we took it on, and as part of the action research, we paired them up with peer mentors from the disability community that had already done this, quote, old timers that had been out there and, and figured out ways to make this happen and OT students in the audience here, um, went out with them and tried to just take it on. Take on the very areas you gave up, figure out the barriers, document them for us, but then also try to strategize in context how to still participate, okay? And what you're seeing here is photo voice. We use photo voice as a participatory methodology where people with disabilities um, uh, worked on taking photos themselves. We had lots of accessible camera adaptations. Um, or instructed us to say, take a picture of me doing this. This really shows it in context what the issues are that I'm facing or the supports. And I just think this, this one picture speaks a thousand words, right? Okay, so this gentleman here is um, a person who had had a stroke, went to the number one rehabilitation facility in Chicago, I won't say the name, um, and, and got very good care. However, as he was leaving, did not have family support, did not have money, and did not have an accessible apartment, and it all fell apart for him. And they landed up saying, go to a nursing home for a short-term stay. Okay, and this was an OT decision um, that was very influential here. He landed up taking eight years before he got out of the nursing home, and only through the disability rights community did that happen, that the door was opened for him. But we caught him the first week out, after he got out, and we said, okay, now's your chance. Let's take on one of those participation goals. And you can see here, he chose Mr. D. Shish Kebab, a very famous one in Chicago. Um, he chose it for a couple of reasons. One is he liked to eat there. But secondly, this was his hangout spot before his stroke. This is where he hung out with the guys, and all of life was processed here, and he hadn't been to it in many, many years. But look at this picture. What's it telling you a story of, right? First of all, we see, obviously, wheelchair access is an issue here 101, right? You know, he's not able to get into Mr. D's shish kebab. Ergo, his participation, the door is closed for him here. But look at some of the else that are things that are happening in this photo. We see an open sign at Mr. D's shish kebab. And we didn't even realize we caught this, but we have a one-way sign pointing into the restaurant. Everything's saying, come in, participate, spend your money here, eat here. And for this very gentleman, you know, both literally and metaphorically, it was not happening. The one way in was closed to him. So I think photo voice is an interesting, you know, kind of methodology to further understand participation. We also learned from this study um, that access includes a lot more than just minimum <coughs> physical access guidelines. For us, it's the Americans with Disabilities Act regulations that everybody looks at. But instead, these individuals, after a stroke and an intellectual disability, documented a lot, of, a lot of other barriers in the environment, including sensory, cognitive, and social communication barriers. And again, you're seeing these are photo voice pictures of in our everyday life. This one in the middle, this was the chore chart for a group home of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. <laughs> right, okay, so just documenting it, you know, could be informative, say, to the group home um, uh, on, on how they could change things. But what was also kind of cool about it is that um, the people also then took out their cameras and said, let me show you how to do it right. 
and they went like to the zoo and to other places that were much more universally accessible and said, you know, this is really quite possible to make this accessible for me. It's not even really that difficult. You just need some examples, right? Um, so how much are we thinking about the cognitive access, the communication access, and social access when we work with people? And two other big barriers that they brought up, again, information access barriers. How do you know what you don't know? I, I hear that so much you know, from people with disabilities. It's like, I see the world around me. We're all using our smartphones and our notebooks and tablets and everything else. But that's not what I get. <laughs> and I'm not getting a lot of access to that in rehab. Like nobody's sitting with me on my iPad and trying to make it accessible with me or figuring out I can use my iPhone. Right, so there's again this disconnect on information access. And then also they're talking about system and economic access as being a huge barrier for many people with disabilities. So when we ask them what do you participate in, we usually get this answer of, I don't. I don't have money at the end of the month to do anything other than those survival and ADL things that I have to take care of, that I was taught in rehab to take care of. But I don't go beyond it because I can't afford it. So my question again back to you, are you discussing this in rehab? Is this part of your decision making um, when people leave on what goals you work on and how you work on those or not? So how can we figure out some of these issues of entry? How can we better respond to some of them? One of the projects I'm on right now, um, it's part of a National Center on Rehabilitation Outcomes in the United States, um, ran by Alan Heineman, who's at the Rehab Institute of Chicago. Um, and luckily for us, we convinced him to do a whole project on let's do an environmental barriers and supports to participation assessment from the perspective of people with disabilities themselves. Let's have them self-rate what's happening in the world. Instead of asking them what's wrong with them, ask them to tell us front and center what's wrong with the environment. How is it disabling me and to what extent is it? And so this assessment um, tool is brand new, validated now, um, with over 2,000 people with uh, traumatic brain injury, stroke, and spinal cord injury as our first sample. Um, and we've been able to show that it actually is able to be used. It is a valid assessment tool. And it, what's also nice about it is we have a computer-adapted test of it now. So instead of having to go through all 300 items across all these environmental barriers, it'll hone in and predict which ones are most a problem for you. And you can do it in about 10 minutes um, to get a pretty good read. And all it is is a screener. You know, something that we could do as rehab professionals that even if we didn't have time during therapy, you could leave this with the person in the waiting room, you know, and have a volunteer do it or take it home and do it, okay? So I think there are some more ways now that we can actually start to get at this information better. So the second issue that's being brought to the table about participation, though, is that getting in the door itself doesn't necessarily equate with meaningful, full participation in that context. So now we get to the second E, and that's the E of engagement, which for those of you who are OTs in the audience should be near and dear to your hearts. Um, how are people with disabilities describing it in these, in these studies? This first quote says, it's not about what I can or cannot do physically. It's about can I do what I want or need to do when, where, and with who I want. Is that a packed quote or what, right? Um, and that's why I love qualitative research, right? Because in the voice of, of, of this person, said it much more elegantly than I could ever say as an OT or as, as an academician. But clearly here you're getting front and center a lot of issues about choice and control front and center. A second quote about engagement. It's about being, quote, a part of something, really feeling included, not just being in the room, but actually being a part of whatever's going on. Are you noting here it's not about my ability to do things completely by myself? There's a difference between activity and participation, right? And participation is that inclusion in that world around you, right, um, kind of thing. It has very little to do whether you're able to do it by yourself or not. So when we looked at engagement and we asked people with cognitive disabilities to tell us, you know, what are the things that, that you're no, no longer participating in, that, you're mo you know, that you've lost in your life, but that you really want to engage in? And here's the answers we got. And again, we didn't use an assessment tool here. 
We used a bunch of magazines and pictures from the community. Um, we brought in a bunch of things and we just walked around the neighborhood and things like that and they pointed out what they wanted to do or took photos of it. And look at these goals that they had that were most um, popular goals for these group. Just being out and about. I don't know how many people just said, I just want to get out of the house. That's my goal, really. <laughs> and they keep saying it. You know, and I'm like, do you want to do anything? No, I just want to get out of the house. Um, you know, and then once you're there, being able to get around once you're in the community, and then social participation outside the home. And again, we get back to this socializing remotely that our society is so using now as a way to socially interact. And look at the percentage of people here after stroke and, and, and intellectual disability as they were aging that were very dissatisfied or had given up these key things. In the gerontology literature with older adults, we have compelling evidence that says these exact four are the ones that lead to not only emotional and physical health, but actually increased, decreased mortality rates, increased lifespan. Yet we haven't done that research with people with disabilities. Why not, right? The other thing we found out from this group is um, engagement is about doing with supports versus performing by yourself. So again, I'm taking you back to this research where we went out, we did these 600 participation audits in context on the goals that they were no longer doing and were dissatisfied. Again, we went out with a peer mentor, somebody else with a disability who had been through it, um, and an OT student to kind of try and problem solve these things. We thought it was an assessment strategy. We didn't think of it as an intervention. But clearly, you can see here that after they did this day of participation, and in some cases it was two or three days, depending on their goals, um, over 97% of the people uh, said that they had met their participation goal, just out of this very, what I would call, basic, simple, um, kind of seat-of-the-pants approach to just an, a regular community audit. But we added a person with disabilities to be a peer mentor into that. Um, and that actually became very central in terms of their ability to strategize even more so above and beyond the OT. But let me point out something to you here. Very few people actually did these activities completely by themselves. E.g., they were not functionally independent. They were scored down on our film um, that we so use in the United States, right? Um, what they did is over 70% used some kind of support, and a lot of them. Right? You know, they strategized, it, whether it was assistive technology, environmental modifications. Sometimes it was changing a system or a policy or asking for help and how to do that. And that's what enabled them to meet those goals. So had we just looked at functional independence in this study, it would not have looked good to the funder. Things didn't change, right? But when we were able to ask about, did you meet your goal? Was it with supports? And let's document the supports you use so that you can continue to use them in the future. We got a very different set of data that we could also report, yes? The other thing that we saw is not, it's, just, it's not about just doing with supports, but about supporting each other and doing together. Um, one of the things we did is we teamed up with um, local disability communities from Centers for Independent Living, as well as People First. I don't know if you're aware of the group. It's a group of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that's a really big self-advocacy group in the state. It's very consumer-directed. Um, and we did a workshop with people before they even went out to participate, where they set goals on how they would support each other. Right? They each offered something to say, I know how to do this, I'll show you how to do this, or I'll help you with this, or you have a wheelchair and if it's not accessible, we'll figure something out, I'll, I'll help you. And we told the caregivers, and, the, and we didn't have any professionals go with us, but the caregivers and staff to leave themselves out of it, to distance themselves completely and just pretend as if they were observers, and that's it, not to control the scenario. And indeed, folks were able to problem solve. They were able to support themselves with significant cognitive disabilities, right? They just needed that support structure, you know, to be able to understand they could support each other. And in fact, we're very good at doing that, right? Um, kind of thing. How much are we incorporating that into our rehab, that social learning, that peer mentoring part of things, you know, as opposed to an OT directing the group um, to do something? So how do we look at engagement? 
Lots more assessments here that let us look at participation engagement, including one of my all-time favorites, the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure that I use all the time. I love it. It's a great research tool to open up a discussion. Um, what I want to share with you is one more tool that we've been involved with, and that's the Community Participation Indicators Assessment, or the CPI. Um, this also came out of Alan Heinemann's outcome, National Outcome Center and was actually an international collaboration with about 10 different countries where we took the best of a lot of participation assessments um, and then we did focus groups with people with disabilities all over the country um, and we added in the things that were missing um, from, from the old assessments and updated them. And what you see in the CPI now is it takes you through participation. It starts you in your home and then it moves you into transportation, getting around outside, then it moves you into community sites, and then finally into work or productive or school sites, and then social networking, including remote social networking via internet and other things like that. And it asks about three different things related to engagement. First of all, how often are you doing it? Which actually was because all the other assessments asked this. In the end, this was the one item that didn't prove to be that useful from a research perspective. It wasn't about how often you participate. It's whether it's meaningful to you or not. So the second question here is, is it important to you? And we simplified it from the COPM to just yes, no. Is it on the docket or not? You know, is this something you want to do or not? And then we added another item, and that is, are you doing it when you want to or need to? Remember that quote from the consumer up front? Participation's about, am I able to do things when I want to or need to? So we added also an indicator of satisfaction right here, too. And the CPI is available for free if you ever want it. I can give you the, the link to download it from the center. Um, and is now undergoing a lot of other international validation as well. It's another way to document participation outcomes from a self-report consumer perspective. Okay, the third issue then with participation that I want to talk about is that meaningful participation in some aspects of life doesn't necessarily equal equal opportunities or full participation in society, okay? And now we're moving on to the third E, and that's the E of enfranchisement. What does enfranchisement mean? This is a quote from another participant in our research, also a poster from the disability community that elegantly puts it forward as well. The person says, it's not about what I can do, can or cannot do physically. Do you remember? You're hearing that, that, that statement again and again. And again. It's not about what I can or cannot do physically. And it's not about whether I'm motivated or not. How am I supposed to, quote, live independently when I don't have access to adequate housing, to transportation, to good work? I'm not damaged. The system is. The society is. Okay. This gets to some of um, Jurgen's points about resistance, and, and, and the stage to resist is sometimes a very positive way to get involved in participation as well. So how can we look at enfranchisement? This one's a lot newer on the docket of how do you assess it, right? But as part of the CPI, when we were um, doing uh, the development of this tool, the focus groups from people with disabilities just were so very rich. Um, and when they were talking about enfranchisement, that we just took direct quotes and we made, it, we made an assessment directly from their quotes. Um, and you see here a number of items related to enfranchisement. I live my life the way I want. I'm welcome in my community. I'm treated equally. I have access to resources to be able to do this. My community respects my voice. Here's my voice. All these kinds of things are in a 48 item enfranchisement scale. Um, that is one way to start to even think about this concept of enfranchisement. And for those of you in the room that are the testing and measurement geeks, anybody measurement in the audience here that does this? Yes? Um, interestingly, the consumer version of enfranchisement was the only scale that actually Roche analyzed as a unidimensional construct. Nothing else did in participation. Um, it was so unique to individuals, but enfranchisement was not. I mean, that was the one that actually showed up as a scale that actually had some construct behind it that was very different than just doing. And I want you to look at that then. When you do Roche analysis, it shows you which items were easiest for people with disabilities to endorse and which one were the hardest. Okay, And look at these ones that are the hardest. The community respects me. 
feeling a part of the community, contributing to my community, having a say. Do you see where the issues are here that we're not getting to that in the rehab front, but yet it's front and center some very important pieces of participation for them. Now, if we're going to look at enfranchisement, though, it's important to have that individual self-report, and I'm glad we finally have some kind of a scale to start to even look at it from a consumer individual self-report. But to be honest, enfranchisement to a large extent is about the community and the society you live in. You know, whether or not it's supporting you to be enfranchised or not, okay? So if we're going to do that, we also need to do research that looks at that, what's happening in that community and environment. And so I'm sharing some results here from another project that I'm working on that's the complete opposite. It is no longer the individual self-report. Instead, it's looking at in the community, in the state, and in the country, what environmental factors are most influencing participation. Um, and we banded with Centers for Independent Living and our ADA regional centers, and their goal was to say, show us some ways that we could visualize these disparities in a compelling way to show our funders and policymakers these exist. There is evidence, right? They needed that evidence in, in some compelling way. And so that's what you're starting to see here. We're starting to visually map it um, as the first set of things that, that's going on right now. So these are GIS maps. I'm just going to take you through a couple of these so you can see starkly the disparities happening. Um, so this map is about people with disabilities living below the poverty level, but in that working age um, kind of thing. On the right, you're seeing the general population in the United States. Um, on the left, you're seeing the people who have self-identified with disability. Okay? The darker the color, the, more, the greater percentage of people living with poverty, under poverty. Okay, which in the United States came to in the $12,000 or under a year range of things. Can you see the stark differences right away? Right? Can you also see it varies by state? So I can start saying to different states, why are you worse than this one? Maybe you should focus on this um, kind of thing. When I do the GIS mapping, I can also drill down though. So I can go into my own state of Illinois, and then I can further click on my own community of Chicago, um, and I can start to see what's happening there. And what do I see? 35%, over a third of the people with disabilities are living below poverty in Chicago. I wonder how many OTs know that, or even you know, are thinking about that as they're working with these individuals into where they're going after this. And oh, just to be fun, I looked up your Canadian statistics just to see, I was thinking, ah, oh, Canada's much better on this, and indeed you are. <laughs> so, so kudos to you, you are better at not having as many people living in that. However, you do have a significant, still a significant group, 14%. But look at one of your statistics. For people with disabilities that are living alone, look at the poverty rate, 31%. Right, so you're almost in line with Chicago on the people with disabilities living alone, right? So, so this is just really interesting research to me to do these comparisons and see what's happening and why. Another example of enfranchisement, this is um, a graph that's showing how many people are no longer in the labor force but are in working age, okay? So we can look at employment, we can look at unemployment. Both of those are very short-term statistics. Not in the labor force means it's been years that these people have given it up. No longer are even in the search for employment anymore. Okay, we see on the left the general population. We see on the right people with disabilities, stark disparities here. We see in Chicago, 62%, almost three times as many people with disabilities are no longer even, don't even have work as a goal, have, haven't even been involved in it in, in years. And when we look at Canada, we see some, even though you're better at employment and, and less unemployment rates for people with disabilities, when we look at how many people aren't in the labor force anymore in Canada, we see 44% of people with disabilities, right? So this is a huge issue for people's identity and their participation. And then I'm just going to give you one example of how to drill down even further with enfranchisement. Now we're actually in Chicago, um, specifically as a community. And just to situate you, here's Lake Michigan. And there's Joy participating fully <laughs> on the lake. Um, however, what's happening to my compatriots with disabilities in the rest of Chicago, right? So when we map this, the first thing we asked is, where are people with disabilities living? 
And what we saw very starkly is the darker the area, the more lower socioeconomic status of it, right? Can you see that they're clustering in the poorest areas of Chicago, okay, when we look at this? The next thing we ask then is, and so where is accessible housing, like subsidies for accessible housing or to you know, modify a unit in that? And we also saw they're segregated in the low income neighborhoods too. And that they weren't getting things like vouchers to go into the northern, more wealthy neighborhoods of the Chicago either. We used this graph to show to policymakers. Um, it landed up becoming a class action lawsuit, which south of the border we're very good at um, uh, uh, doing. It is our only way to change things often. Um, and it got in a 200% increase in vouchers for people in the Chicago area and further put regulations on the wealthy neighborhoods to say, you cannot do this. This is against the law to not have accessible units available for people um, to be able to do it, right? So you can see how the research can affect policy if done well, right? If, if you put it in compelling ways. Okay, the last issue I want to talk about here from the disability community, though, is that civil rights itself does not necessarily equal community power, culture, or social capital, right? And now we're getting into that fourth E of empowerment. And when I talk about empowerment, I'm not talking about self-advocacy here or self-empowerment. I'm talking about social empowerment of people with disabilities as a social group in our society. Okay, so what does that mean? So it means do social groups have a voice, a seat at the table, a foot or a wheel in the door? Do they have social capital in that society? That is, are their voices and their differences acknowledged and respected in that society? And here we are back to the nothing about us without us, and we can adjust to Simi Litton's even better version of it. So what's the goal of empowerment? Well, the goal of empowerment is to respect diversity and differences rather than trying to fit everyone into some, quote, normal or not designation. I hear a lot in my own profession of OT in the States that people just haven't accepted their disability yet. Have you ever heard that? You know, where we couldn't work on that because they're just not ready and they just haven't accepted it. When they say it, accept is a very negative thing. It's like somehow it's like give up your goals and dreams, right? That's what they're saying. That that disability is not a good thing in your life. Accept it but move on, you know, kind of thing. Whereas the disability community would say, no. Um, there's a whole community of people with disabilities out there now um, that that are very empowered, um, that have their own ownership of disability as a term. They're creating art, culture, community about it. They do activism together. They're a social support network that's a very positive identity group, right? Um, and too often in rehab, we don't use the positive, right? And even when we put positive items into our enfranchisement scale about that people with disabilities are respected, we got some feedback from the other researchers saying, no, no, it's just about stigma, right? You know, it's just about the negative things in society. And it's like, no, it's not. It is about a positive identity. It's about disability pride and culture and some of these terms that we have such a hard time wrapping our heads around as rehab professionals. So if we're going to go into empowerment, what might that look like for us? Well, I think a rehab can't empower somebody. You know, they need to come. They need to gain that power themselves. And one of the ways that's been shown to be able to gain that power is through um, the community of learning with other people with disabilities that have gone through it, that can positively model it, that can show you the ropes, and also as a long-term support network as well. Okay. So in this case, we're doing a lot of interventions now that again are in that social learning, bringing people together with disabilities as a group and that people with disabilities are actually co-facilitating the group with us. It's not the OT leading it, it's the people with disabilities, the peer mentors doing it, and the OT steps in as a consult, if needed, to help brainstorm something or strategize something. Um, but these interventions look very different. You can tell, we have in giant town halls and community meetings and things where people are brainstorming together on the issues. That looks very different than what we know of as OT right now. And this one just shows you how we've taken that then, and we actually now have four different community interventions and four different grants where we're doing that social learning model, and we've actually applied it to participation now. So we're working with people to be able to learn how to manage their health, how to live in the community and stay out of a nursing home, how to get out into the community and participate, how to get into some meaningful work, 
and then we do a whole thing on social networking and positive identity um, as a person with a disability. So building that empowerment. And this is kind of our model right now for doing some interventions on participation. And what we're starting to measure is, did it impact participation, obviously, um, but also, did it maybe impact health? We'll keep looking. And I want to leave you then with a quote um, from one of the participants about why it's so important for us to think about this social community of learning as an intervention um, model as well. And the person says, you, pointing to the other group members, taught me how to fish. You know, like that story about teaching someone to fish versus feeding them. Now I feel good about myself and about other people with disabilities too. And I really want to help them do the same thing, to feel like they matter. Why can't rehab be more like this? And I leave you with that statement. Why can't rehab be more like this? And also forward you to a big thank you to all of the different disability communities that have been so elegantly and actively involved in informing this research. Thank you. This is also another one, like Lisa and yours, where people have to reflect on that whirlwind tour of participation. Uh, can you elaborate a little more on the interventions that you're doing, the actual interventions? Yeah. Um, we've married disability rights with self-management, a la Kate Lorig and Albert Bandura. Um, so, we're looking at the self-management approaches that um, Kate Lorig did in nursing um, to work with people with chronic conditions, mainly on health symptom behaviors. It hasn't gone into participation, but it's managing your symptom, symptoms. And she used Albert Bandura's self-efficacy theory and social learning theory, that you learn as much from other people who are going through this or have been through it as you do from a professional. And she's got elegant decades of you know, randomized clinical trials that show that um, uh, uh, she calls it a lay-led intervention, which means the consumers are directing it along with a, a, a professional sometimes co-directs it. In our case, we do have an OT co-directing with um, a consumer. Um, and the whole thing is not teaching you how to do something. It's teaching you a problem-solving model, um, a goal-setting process, um, where you then strategize how, how to get it to happen and you're working on your own individual goals. But it's a process of decision making and problem solving versus a first do this, then do the, the cookbook approach, right, you know, kind of thing. And so that's what we're doing. And we're doing it with small groups. We've done it with people with stroke after rehab um, to get back into the community. We've done it with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and did some adaptations to it so to make it more cognitively accessible, more use of video, photos, you know, lots of other things going on in it. Um, for people who are at risk for getting, for landing up not staying in the community, right? That their parents are aging and they might go into a nursing home or a more restrictive setting. So we've done it with that group. And um, we just completed a study with the state of Illinois on people with diverse disabilities getting out of nursing homes, um, going into the community, um, which is a really diverse group. It's mixed between people with psychiatric disabilities, physical disabilities, and cognitive, usually all of the above at once, um, that have been classically in the United States put into nursing homes as the hidden institutionalization piece, right? Um, and now because of the ADA and Olmstead um, and class action lawsuits, it's been determined illegal to do that, right, by a state. And so we've used this intervention with people to get them out of the mindset of a nursing home or even out of the mindset of I can't do. I'm not good enough to do. I didn't get the seven point score on the film. Um, to this is how I can do it with supports. And we also teach a lot on risk with dignity, right? So instead of saying I'm unsafe as a person, saying, okay, maybe you are unsafe as a person, right? We're all a little unsafe. We're all a little risky in our everyday lives, right? Um, but here's supports that we could put in the environment. We're going to try them with you and see if we can reduce that risk enough that you can manage it. Right? And, and that's what the state is now funding in Illinois. Um, across, across the state, we now have Medicaid funding, which was a big deal for us to get federal funding to pay for a disability-led intervention. I mean, when we got it, we're like, oh, 
<laughs> it was very exciting to see them say that an OT and a, a disability um, peer mentor together um, actually has the compelling enough evidence that will fund it as a Medicaid um, intervention. So that's kind of where we're headed, and you saw that complex diagram of all the different things we work on. It varies by group which ones we work on and how far we get into some of them, but it's very much um, patient activation models, shall I say, and, and I don't want to use the word patient here because it's really not patient. It's very consumer um, or participant oriented, but it is how do you teach people a problem solving model to move through this so they could apply it to any participation goal, not just the one I taught them. And if they can't do it by themselves, we have um, other peer mentors and or family members and other people come to the intervention with us at different times and support them, learn how to support them so that they still can be as in control as possible. We kind of de-brainstorm, uh, uh, like we take away all their assumptions and say, okay, let them be risky for a minute, trust us, you know, kind of thing that we'll get through this and figure it out with each other. Um, so sometimes it's a lot of caregiver and staff kind of refocusing as well that goes on here. Yeah, it's a fun intervention from a from a perspective of people who are in it. Really, um, it's just amazing to see the transformations in power that they gain. Right, not just in participation, but you know they become a little radicalized, you know, and 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 actually take on some big things and join the community to act activate or sorry, to advocate for other people with disabilities to take on much bigger issues in lives than just, you know, I can't do this, um, which is kind of cool to see. Thank you. Do we have another question? I wanted to know, I thank you for your talk, and I wanted to know where you think you should enact those activities. I just talked about the, the fact that many people were funding this. I know that all of this can go through because of research funds, so when these funds are not there anymore, where would you enact those peer groups in which yeah. institutions? Yeah. Where would you see it? Um, okay, so a couple of these are research demonstration grants that we're doing. The ones that we did with people with stroke was a, was a research demonstration, and the one that we did with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities was a demonstration project. Um, the other one I, I talked about, though, the we finally call it the Escape the Nursing Home Project. The state doesn't like it when we say that, but that's exactly what we're doing. Um, that one actually, it's, it's far past research. We did the first 150 people. We showed the evidence. We tracked participation and health outcomes, documented it all, you know, pre-post, compelling set of evidence for them. Um, and so that's funded by the state now. We no longer have anything to do with the funding of it. Um, we no longer control it. It's done by Centers for Independent Living um, throughout that are controlling that and how it's delivered. Um, so what we could offer to them is evidence, you know, on, on a very different program that the state really didn't get until we showed them, you know, really didn't think it was going to work. Um, until we could show them to do that. And we can also offer them ways to document the outcomes. So when the disability community does this, um, that they're able to continue to sustain those programs by continuing to show the evidence and not just stop doing that research part of it, right? So we spend a lot of time more on knowledge translation to get the disability community to use it and keep documenting the evidence. Otherwise, it'll get taken away. Yeah? Yeah. All right, so thank you very much. Um, it's time for the panel discussion now, so I'd like to invite our three speakers to come back here to the table, as well as Annie Rochette, professor here at the school, to lead the discussion.